So the first thing we need to know about the book of Genesis, the, the entire book itself, kind of like a, a bird's view, you know, a, a general v overview, is that the book of Genesis is divided into 11 parts. And this isn't, this isn't a, like an outline that we impose on the Torah, on the book, but it is organic. It comes right out of the text, and I'll show you. Uh, go to Genesis 2, 4. Or, yeah, Genesis 2, chapter, uh, verse 4. And you know this phrase. Genesis 2, 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth. This is the account of the heavens or the earth. Okay, we're going to take this word account, the word toldot in the Hebrew. We're going to do a, a quick search on this. And here's what we get. So Genesis 2.4, this is the account of heavens and earth. Genesis 5.1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Now you see how the word generation is highlighted and the word account is highlighted. Translated differently in the English, same Hebrew word, the word toldot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 5-1, this is the generation, the book of the generations of Adam. 6-9, these are the records of the generations of Noah. 10.1. Now, these are the records of generation of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. Um, then we go to the next. Not every one is an important theological one, but we go to the next one, 10, uh, 11, 10. These are the records of the generation of Shem. Now, you see how it started with heavens and earth, and then it's kind of shrinking, kind of focusing, right? We started big again here with Noah, now his sons, and now we go to one of his sons, Shem. Then, uh, 1127, these are the records of the generation of Terah. Terah is Abraham's father. Okay? Now we begin to see something else here. That it says, this is the records of the generation of Terah, but it is not the story about Terah. It's the story about Abraham. So it kind of looks forward, it doesn't look backwards. Next one, 25, 12. Now these are the records of the generations of Ishmael. And it's going to have another, uh, let's see, uh, the records of the generation of Isaac. And the, the generations of Isaac is going to be the story of Jacob. So it looks forward. Uh, these are the records of the generation of Esau, and Esau gets two, again in 36.9, and then these are the records of the generation of Jacob, and this is Genesis 37. Look at the first word after that, Joseph. So this is the story of Joseph in Genesis 37, right? Joseph, this is primarily Joseph and Judah. They are the ones that are going to be featured here. And, and then that takes us all the way to the end of the chapter. So if you were to count, you take all these uh, occurrences of the word generation, you're going to have 10. Wait, but I said there were 11. Okay, so 10, you have 10 beginning in Genesis 2-4, right? Let's go back to Genesis 2-4, uh, right here. So you have 10 plus Genesis 1. Amen. That's your 11th part. Yes. All right. So now let's go back in, into the meaning of this. Because we see, let's go back over here. We see in Genesis 5.1, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And it kind of makes sense. This is the story of, of what happens after him. Right? But you see how they translate, they have to translate it differently in 2.4. It says, this is the account. Why? Because you can't say this is the generation of heaven and earth. 
because it's almost like you're saying these are the, this is a story of the children of. And you have people after chapter 5, Adam and Terah and Noah and Shem, but the first one, it doesn't quite fit. You can't say these are the generations of heavens and earth. Right? These, are, these are the children of heaven and earth. You can't say that. So you have to say something different. So they chose to say here, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. But um, there, is a, uh, there is a different way to arrive at a better way to understand it. And that is by the function of the word. Sometimes you have to tell the dictionary, okay, you're, you're really not all that helpful at this point. I need to know how is this word functioning here. And when you go deeper and you study this, then you, you come to the realization that this little word told up, translated account or generations, is functioning to, in the way of telling us what became of so and so or such and such. Let's try it. This is the book of what became of Adam. This is what became of him. And we're going to get into some of these details as we go through the book. So we're seeing kind of like an introduction form right now. This is what became of Noah, his children. This is what we became of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is what became of Shem. This is what became of Terah, etc., etc. Now you can take that back to chapter 2, and it fits now. This is what became of heavens and earth. Now watch this. When you say that, this is what became of heavens and earth, you're in chapter 2. What is going to happen in chapter 2? Well, we're going to go, we go back into day 6, right? Adam is, create, is already created. Eve is formed. They're in the garden. They're given the commandment, don't eat from this tree. You can eat from this, but not from that. Then it goes into chapter 3, and they fail. And they are expelled. Then it goes into chapter 4, and you have Cain and Abel. And they further fail, or Cain, and he is further expelled, even farther away. We'll get into the details of what that means next week. But you begin to see the overview, the big picture of this, this verse right here encompasses the rest of the Bible. The rest of the Bible is the story of what became of heavens and earth. And how does the Bible end? With a new heavens and earth. Revelation 21 and 22. So that phrase, this is what became of, then has deep theological implications. The, the story that follows is going to is going to tell us what the, what the writer, Moses, and what the author, the Holy Spirit, want to communicate to us through this story. And we'll get into the details of that, but we, want, we need to see it, first of all, we need to see it, uh, we need to see the big picture of it. All right. I know this is probably raising more questions than answers, <laughs> but that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Uh, and we'll answer hopefully some of those questions as we go. Okay, so you have 10 sections of that, that are telling us, preparing us to ask the question, okay, what became of this and what became of so-and-so, what became of that? But then now that we have all those 10 sections, now we need to go even further back and ask, all right, so what about Genesis 1? What about everything before 2-4, before Genesis 2-4. Um, all right. So here's what we know. 
We know that every section begins with the word toldot. This is what we came of. And so that section serves as an introduction, right? So it serves as an introduction to what is going to follow. Um, and, 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 and in some cases, it's kind of like a, a, a little bit of a summary. You know, this is what became of heavens and earth. Okay, so now we are alerted. We know it's kind of giving us this subject, right? It's kind of like your title on your email. Oh, okay, I know what this email is about. Let me now read the details, right? Hopefully, if you get an email that's well titled. <laughs> I always work on my titles for my emails. Whether I want to reveal or I want to conceal. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do that, right? You want them to read this stuff. <laughs> um, well, then if the rest of the book has that kind of a structure, right, beginning with an introductory phrase that kind of serves uh, as, a, as a summary, introductory slash summary, this is what became of, well, you have now a section, Genesis 1, that you need to analyze now. Does, if the author gave a section, introductory section to each part of the chunk of the book, did he do the same with the first part? It stands to reason that he would. He seems methodical in introducing every section of the book, giving it a specific title. That kind of serves as a summary. Well, did he do that? I contend that he did. And we need to look at, at the first verse of the first section, which is Genesis 1-1. So now we're starting to get a picture of the, the, the function of Genesis 1-1, verse 1. So if the structure is consistent, then Genesis 1-1 should also be an introductory, introductory phrase and a summary for what's coming in the rest of the section, the rest of the chapter. Well, look, we have in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Big summary. <laughs> and an introductory phrase. Verse 2 then begins with the details. Now, here's how we can understand that even better. The first phrase, in the beginning, Yeshua talked about this. Let me look it up here so we can read it. Um, I believe it, it was in um, Matthew 19. He was asked about divorce. And so he gave an answer here. Let me make it a little bigger so we can read it on the screen. Uh, so they ask him, is it lawful, verse 3, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Okay, we're not going to get into all the discussion of that, but, but we're going to highlight just one little part of his answer. He says, verse 4, and he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them, okay, hello, he's talking about creation, right? He who created them from the beginning, Genesis. He's talking about Genesis. From the beginning, made them male and female. All right, we'll stop right there. So from the beginning, or in the beginning, he made them male and female. Now, my question to you is this. On what day did God create Adam and Eve? Day six. So Yeshua is saying... Day six is part of the beginning. He's saying, in the beginning, he created man and, 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 and woman. So day six is part of the beginning. So the picture we're getting here is that the first week, all of it, every, all the seven days of the first week, that is the beginning. So when we take this back to Genesis, right, we return back to Genesis 1, we read it again. In the beginning, 
in the first seven days, in the first week, that's what the beginning means. It's not day one. The beginning is not just day one. Because Yeshua says, Adam and Eve were created in the beginning, which is day six. So now we know day six is part of the beginning. So it's a whole week. So in the first week, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And everything is in. Exactly. So now we have that, we, we see that it serves as an introductory title for the whole section and a summary because uh, it speaks of the entire week. The section is going to take us day by day. The title already told us what happened in the entire week. So it is a summary for the entire week, for the entire passage. So the author is consistent in his method of writing the book. Every section begins with an introductory title that serves also as a summary for the whole section. Don't you feel like I, I have a map now to read Genesis? <laughs> right? A little bit. <laughs> okay, so let's keep going now. Let's get now into the details of the chapter. So now we know we're talking about the whole week. So he is preparing the ground now. In verse 3, he's going to get going with day 1, right? We know that. So what happens in verse 2? Why did he, rise, why did he write verse 2 then? Why didn't he go straight into day 1? Because he needed to lay out some more foundation for the chapter. So verse 2 is foundational for chapter 1. You've got to understand day two and it is it's going to blow you away think of this <clears throat> who is writing this Moses right Moses is the writer God is the author right he's not just dictating to him he's using even Moses' research his literary capabilities so all of this, the Holy Spirit has uh, overseeing power over all this. So verse 2, he, he's writing this, Moses is writing this to Israel after they came out of Egypt. Amen. Amen. That's when Moses is writing this. He didn't write it when he was in the wilderness. He didn't write it while he was going back and forth with Pharaoh. He probably didn't write it before Sinai. In fact, he doesn't come even into the picture initially. Right, right, it's not about him. Yeah, but we know that he's writing about lessons of faith. He's writing about lessons of faith. And the reason is because Israel is failing at faith over and over. They need to read this. They need to read. They need to understand that the way to observe the Torah that was given at Sinai is by walking in the same way that, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob walked. In the same way that Abel walked in the same way that Enoch walked and Noah walked. So all of this has a Torah context. Uh, context. So the readers are Israel after coming out of Egypt. That, right? That's who's reading this. So imagine you're, you're Israel, you just came out of Egypt, and Moses writes this book, you are reading Genesis for the first time time. And here's what you read, right? You read verse 1. In the first week, God created everything. And you go to verse 2, and it says, the earth, and you stop right there on your tracks. Because you're not reading this in, in English. You're reading this in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, it says, Haaretz. Haaretz. That 
is the land of Israel. It doesn't mean the earth, or it, it can mean the earth, but mostly, in most contexts in the Torah, it means the land. The land. If you go to Israel, or, or, or if you've been overseas, you, you've, you've probably heard this, this, this is very common, especially overseas. That you refer to the, to, the, to the United States, you refer to it as the States. Are you from the States? Yeah, I'm from the States. This is much more common when you're overseas. Well, Israel has a short name like that. Are you from the land? Yes, I'm from the land. Have you ever been to the land? Yes. Amen. When are you going to the land? I'm, yeah, I want to go to the land. Now, if you were to say that in Hebrew, you would say Haaretz. Are you going to Haaretz? Yes, I hope to go next year. No, I've never been to Haaretz. Yes, I went last year to Haaretz. Haaretz, Haaretz, Haaretz. This is the land of Israel. So you are coming out of Egypt, you are an Israelite, and you read this text, and it says that that land promised, that land where you are going, that's, you can almost smell the, the air, that you're walking through the wilderness to get to it, you've heard of this, you know this. So it says, the earth, the Haaretz, was formless and void. This is talking about the land of Israel. Genesis 1 is not only talking about the whole world. Let me put it this way. If you're, I have my teenagers and, you know, they're starting to drive and Jonathan drove us this morning, uh, getting into the expressway and going 70 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a man of faith. <laughs> so your son comes to you and he asks, Hey dad, can I borrow the wheels? <laughs> this is a figure of speech. You know that you can you can talk about the totality of it by referring to a specific part of it. So when he asks for the wheels, he's not just asking you to borrow the tires. <laughs> he wants the whole thing, right? Well, guess what? The same applies here. This is also a figure of speech. By talking about the land, the land of Israel, God is also referring to the whole world. So in a sense, yes, God created the whole world. Of course he did the first week. But he is calling it a specific, he, he's referring to a specific part of it. The land of Israel. So this chapter in detail refers to the land of Israel. Yes. Because the whole earth was supposed to be like the land of Israel. Yes. It's like the big brother. <laughs> Everybody's supposed to be. You want to be like your big brother, your big sister, right? The firstborn. So, the earth, Israel, was formless and void. All right, so now we move into, okay, what does this mean? All right, we don't have a whole, whole lot of time. But we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of these details at some, some other point. But think about the word formless, form. It's talking about shape. It's talking about form, the shape of it. It had no shape. And think about the word void. It means empty, right? So the land at this point was empty. There were, there were no people. There were no animals. So that's what it's referring to. I, I've not created anybody yet. So yeah, of course it's void. 
And it is formless. You know why it's formless? Because it is covered with water. We know that. It's right there. It says, And darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. We know this. So you see how the parts that we know help us understand the parts that we don't know very well. So, that's what it is referring to. Now, this is going to become in the prophets, this phrase, formless and void. Isaiah uses this phrase two or three times, and, and, and I believe Jeremiah too. And it becomes a description of the exile, a description of judgment coming upon the land. Every time that there is judgment coming upon the land, these two thoughts are present. I am going to drive you out from the land, so the land is going to become void. And I am going to turn the land into a wilderness. Because remember that little incident with Noah? Right? That huge rain? Well, God said, okay, I'm not going to do that again. But in essence, the whole earth covered with water had the intention of making it unfruitful. The wilderness accomplishes the same. It makes the land unfruitful. You can't plant anything. It won't give you any fruit. So every time, every, every time that there is judgment coming upon the land and upon the people of Israel in the land of Israel, it is, it is depicted as, as God taking everything back to before creation. I'm going to make it unfruitful. And we know this because the covenant, the covenant promises and curses are all about agriculture. And are all about fruitfulness, both in land as well as in animal and man. So, the land of Israel was covered with water, formless. It had no people or animals, void. This, these two are going to now form an outline for the chapter. Because on days one, two, and three, he is going to take care of the form. He's going to take, take care of the waters. And on day uh, four, five, and six, he is going to fill it. So it becomes an outline. In essence, God is demonstrating, I turn a cursed land into a fruitful land. Amen. This is a lesson on, day one, on page one of the Torah. This is what I do. This is what I do. I turn curse into blessing. That's my MOS. <laughs> now get this too. God could have, it, we know he could have spoken the whole thing already pristine and already shiny, and he chose not to do it that way. He could have, but he chose to do it this way. And let me add, uh, you remember Elijah's confrontation with the prophets of Baal and all of that, and he challenged them, right? He said, okay, you start the sacrifice at 9 a.m., and they were trying and trying, you know, crying out to Baal, send fire from heaven, and of course nothing happened. And then at 3 p.m., here's Elijah's turn. Now he's going to cry out to the Lord. But before he does that, he says, I want you to pour some water on this sacrifice. I want you to pour more and more and more. It, the whole thing became like a little pond. <laughs> Why did he do that? To make it even more difficult, to make it even more impossible, miraculous, miraculous and supernatural. <laughs> Only fire from heaven can come and ignite this sacrifice in this wood that is so wet. So he made it. This is at, this is at the direction of the Holy Spirit, of course. So this is what God did in Genesis 1. 
You see, God made it extremely, extremely impossible and more difficult, if there's anything difficult, more difficult for himself to teach us, to show us, I make impossible things fruitful. That's the whole purpose. It was a faith lesson on page one. I am the God of the impossible. I turn curse into fruitfulness. You see how theologically rich this chapter is? It's foundational. If you can just have one chapter of the Bible, I would choose Genesis 1. I would know God and I would know what he is all about. <laughs> In fact, if you want to go through our website and, and dig deep, you, you'll find a, a message, and some of you will remember this actually, a, 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 I think it was a couple of messages that I titled, The End Times in Genesis 1. And you're like, what? Okay, you're making that up. I gotta go check those, that, those messages. There's no end times in Genesis 1. All right, Joey, I know you can pull out some good stuff out of the scripture, but I, I think you, you made this up. <laughs> well, go check me out. <laughs> Genesis 1, you can see amazing stuff, references, clear references to the end times. But that's all I'm going to say about that, because we, we're running out of time. Um, and we're in verse 2. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bob has seen this before. <laughs> All right, so verse three. We know, we know, we know the structure now, right? Day one, the first thing that God tackled was darkness, and He's going to create light, and it says. But God saw that it was good, right? And then he moves on to day two, verse six. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning a second day, Wait a minute. We were supposed to read, and God saw that it was good. But it didn't say that. Did you ever notice that? On day two, God didn't say it was good. Wow. Why? What does that mean? He goes on to day three. Then God said, let there be waters below the heavens. Uh, in all of that, and we see in verse, um, in verse uh, 12, the end of verse 12, and God saw that it was good. You see, the reason why, when, you, when we go back to verse, to, to day two, he created the expanse, he separated the waters. In day three, he made the, the dry ground appear, and he created vegetation. On day one, he created the light. Not the sun yet, but the light. So the light began to shine on the earth on day one. Day two, it is still covered with water. Day three, water is separated. Now you have ground and you have vegetation. You see, day two, did not advance the purpose of making a fruitful earth, a fruitful land to sustain life. You had some progress, but you still had the whole earth covered with water. That is the reason why he didn't say that it was good. Are we still relating this not as the globe, but down to both Israel? Both. Okay. Primarily to the land of Israel and by extension to the globe. Yeah. This is 
This is kind of like ancient thought process. This is not really what we in the Western world think exactly. of things. Exactly. There, there's always this duality in ancient mm -hmm. thought processing which changes the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> it's not this or that, but it's both. Both. So, that helps us, that little lack of the phrase, God saw that it was good on day two, helps us understand the meaning of the word good, which is also very foundational. You see, good is that which is beneficial to make something fruitful. That's the meaning of the word good. Good is that which is beneficial to make something or someone fruitful. So we have a joke, uh, Michelle and I, right? Because usually we will say the word better. You don't want good, you want better or best, right? Well, we understand what the word good means, so now we want good. We want fruitfulness. Good is that which is beneficial to make you fruitful. You want to be fruitful. You want to be, you want the good. And, um, and, that, and so we see that throughout the chapter, right? So the first three days, God is going to form, give form, take care of the water, and make the land fruitful. So we have vegetation at the end of day three. And then day four, five, six, he begins to fill it out. He fills the expanse with the planets and the stars. He fills the earth with the animals. And then ultimately, he creates man. It gives, it gives new emphasis. I, it goes through my head. All things are possible. Only believe. The mm -hmm. emphasis on belief. It increases our faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's very important because the theme of the Torah is you have to believe. You have to, and believing comes by hearing. That's why the Shema is foundational. You've got to hear the Lord. Hear his voice so that you have faith and then you can walk in what he's commanding you. Mm -hmm. So we'll end with this. With the, the, in Genesis 1, priority has theological uh, uh, meaning. So the creation of light, white light first, Light is going to be the source of life for this vegetation that is, that is being created here. But then also, then also you have, um, so priority has theological importance, but then also the climax has theological importance because this is a story. So at the climax you have the creation of man. So all of this emphasis on creating a fruitful land was to sustain human life, to sustain life. And so the theme of life is at the beginning and at the end of the week. It's through and through all about life because it is all about fruitfulness, creating fruitfulness. And we go then with all of this thought of life. If it was, if it was possible, you climb even higher and you get to the day that he blesses and he sanctifies. Remember, to sanctify is to fill with life. You have an entire week where the focus was life. And then you, you get to the seventh day and the focus is even more life. Sanctification. Sanctification. And so it ends on, on the highest climax possible.